Hi guys, welcome back to the Casual Watch View channel. So today I have a guest. So thanks Chris for joining me today. Thanks, uh, Chris and I have been working on an upload, which I'm hoping to release soon. But while Chris was round, he actually bought his own watch collection. So we thought it'd be pretty cool to take you through a subscriber's watch collection. We met at a recent OC Chrono event, which is a great little event. If you're in South uh, California, there's a San Diego mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. There's one here in Orange County. Really cool. I'll splice in some photographs here of the most recent one. Before we get started, Chris has been here for hours and we've been trying, <laughs> we've been working on my Seiko Turtle. So maybe do you want to tell us a bit about what we've what the future video will be about. Yeah, yeah. Well, Sam Sam basically said that, you know, he'd been you've been sort of struggling with, you know, this the time on the turtle and it, and I think regulation takes just some time to sort of figure out where the watch is running, where it's got to be. So I, I offered my uh, services. I'm just up the road here, and we uh, thought we'd uh, film uh, taking it apart and kind of showing you guys what it takes uh, and the patience you have to have in order to uh, regulate something like that. And it's something that you're interested in knowing more yeah. about. So I thought we'd uh, you know have a day and uh, play with some Seiko movements, time some watches, and uh, kind of hang out. Yeah. So look out for that coming soon. Big thanks to Chris. He bought his entire kit with him today. So let's flip the camera around and dive into the watch review. Let's start in this top corner. So this is one that I've only ever seen in a store, and this is the the Swatch System 52. So tell us a bit about this one. System 51. System uh, 51. <laughs> yeah. So it, um, yeah, this this it came out three, four years ago now, and um, it's it was the technology of it super interesting. Uh, 51 parts, um, and it's hermetically sealed, so put together by robots. Um, and I love the fun little spiral in the back when you, when the rotor turns. Oh yeah, we can get it going there. You know, and uh, so great watch to sort of show, uh, you know, young ones how, uh, how, how watches are, how they were. <laughs> back in the day. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's sort of, a, it kicked off an interest in uh, Swiss watches. Um, like I said, back, back three, four years ago, I saw the technology and then it was weird. I didn't, I didn't realize that, um, mechanical watches were automatic. I thought that was like a new invention four or five years ago. And so it was just a sort of a discovery that, uh, we have these amazing little machines. Next up is the, it is considered one of the best value dress watches. I would say you've probably heard about it a lot on YouTube and this is the Orient Bambino. So how did you get into this one? Uh, so uh, yeah, it, it was, uh, it was on a Thanksgiving sale, I think a couple years ago and it is absolutely like it hits, uh, for me, it's that Bauhaus style. Um, you know, they've got a couple of different versions with the, with the Romans and the, uh, you know, different, different dials, but this one particularly just sort of that clean, uh, pearlescent sort of white, uh, dress watch. It's got that big, big dome crystal on it and it just, you know which really is like sort of standard issue dress watch. So, I mean, if, if, uh, if that's what you're going for, I mean, this is, this is definitely a great value. Next along is one of my personal favorites in your collection. And this is the Bell and Ross. This is the GMT automatic Watts. Mm -hmm. How did you get into Bell and Ross? Cause I noticed there's another one here as well, a vintage one, which we'll get to. Yeah. So this, uh, this sort of started it for me, uh, Bell and Ross. So I, I had been aware of the brand. Um, but, uh, a couple years ago, they released this at, uh, Basel, um, and it caught my attention. Um, I'm an IT guy. And so I, I often have to know, uh, what the time is, uh, GMT, as well as, you know, I've got clients and, and computers in, in various places throughout the world. So GMT complication was, was what I was going for. And the design language of Bell and Ross, I mean, just immediately struck me. Uh, when I when I first saw this, I said, "This is you know, this is gorgeous. I got to go try it on." Uh, so this is basically my everyday. So true, yeah, true GMT, um, and it's the first uh, it's the first one that Bell and Ross has done a black with the gray. So it's the it's their it's their vintage, um, and I think you know it's interesting. Bell and Ross, newer company, started in you know the the late '90s, and I think they get some some maybe some guff because they're not a 200 year old Swiss brand. Uh, but one thing's interesting that they love to do is, well, if we were around in the seventies and we did a, a GMT in the seventies, what would it look like? Yeah. And this is what it looked like. And it's a departure. I know 
you've got two Bell and Ross ones here, but mm-hmm. they're not the traditional kind of square mm-hmm. airplane yep. gauge. Yeah, what they're what they're sort of known for, what they got famous for. The GMT hand looks cool as yeah, well, that like real flash of orange. Pop of orange, yeah. Uh, especially be- for what is quite a monochromatic dial and uh, bezel, to have that flash of orange looks mm-hmm. awesome, very yeah. distinctive. Now this, is this, is this a complete mod or yep. is this, I was going to say I've not noticed this is a Seiko design before. Yeah, so it's a, so it's a SNZ G case. So it's that, uh, it's that 41 or 42 millimeter, the um, uh, military style case. Um, and what I've done is uh, uh, had some fun with it. We popped, I uh, popped a, uh, that's a SKX 009 dial. Um, and some different hands on there. And, you know, the SKX, the, the, the SKX, such an iconic dial, such a, such an icon in itself, um, that, uh, you know, putting it in something, uh, putting in something completely different, you know, giving it a completely different style, um, had a lot of fun with this. Very, uh, it's sort of my postmodern take. Yep. And it's got a, uh, so switch it up, got a, uh, NH35, so it hacks and hand lines and, uh, um, Super, you know, I don't often wear it. It's my like, uh, it's my fun summer or like, uh, I think I took it to uh, Disney and had some uh, some pictures with the Millennium Falcon, you know, that like, <laughs> that future space, yeah. you know, the fun future space kind of uh, theme to it. Yeah, I think I took my Tudor to that Millennium Falcon, the one, in, the one in Florida. No, I like the design of this. I know there'll be some sort of SKX purists that mm-hmm. might question why you put it in a different case, but I think it does work. Okay, so next up is did, did Bell and Ross make this for Zinn or Zinn made it for Bell and Ross? Yeah, so the story is the story is interesting. So this one of the reasons why I, uh, you know, why I'm sort of drawn to the, more drawn to the brand. So the, the backstory is the guys that started Bell and Ross, Bellamic, actually did a uh, internship with Zinn, with Helmut Zinn. Um, so he was in the, you know, in the, in the watch shop and uh, working with them. Um, and back in the, uh, early nineties, they noticed that, uh, Zinn didn't really market their watches to the United States or, you know, all over the world. And so, uh, Bell and Ross made a marketing pitch to Zinn that ultimately became Bell and Ross ultimately became, uh, you know, their company. So, so for the beginning from, uh, about 94, I believe. Uh, to about 2003 or four, um, Zinn was manufacturing all of Bell and Ross's watches, and then um, and then in 2005 when they when they introduced that square, sort of that iconic square military style. But but their background has always been these military style tool watches, and Zinn is very much a part of that. So Zinn have this exact model, mm-hmm. but with their so this is the. It's, yeah, it's basically the Zin 144, and I and again, I think I think a lot of people sort of discount the like, oh well, you know, it's just rebranded. Well, it's not actually rebranded; it's dual branded. So I mean, they they felt strongly enough about the partnership that they they put by Zin on the dial. Mm. Um, you can just see it there, can't yeah. we? I love this orange hand, and considering this watch is from the late '90s, there's not it, it is has the loom aged or was it this kind of peach color on yeah. the yeah so this is uh, interesting so this is it is it's an aged so this is a tritium uh tritium loom that's that's aged up um so it gives it that nice little uh, sort of yellow yellow color and i'm uh you know it's funny i after seeing this i'm i'm sort of like taken on the 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 faux patina i enjoy the real patina so much that i'm sort of you know <laughs> yeah i don't know if i could get a watch with faux patina after this but yeah, I'm the I mean, this watch has got so much going on. Chronograph complication, there's the GMT down here as well. Mm-hmm. It's amazing, really. Amazing um, feat of engineering. Yeah. So then we have another Zinn and Bell and Ross collaboration or yeah, a partnership. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. An early, an early Bell and Ross. Yep, by Zinn. Yep. And, and so, so this is what would be considered their their 103. This is Zinn 103, but Bell and Ross sold it as the um, uh, classic chronograph. Um, but it is all, you know, it is basically the same size and dimensions and case as a, uh, as a 103. This is a, uh, this is one of those watches that, uh, that you have to try on. It is, uh, 17 mil thick with the dome crystal, with the dome sapphire on both sides. Uh, so you definitely, it's one of those watches you definitely have to try on because it, it's like, you have to, you know, sort of see how it wears before you, uh, you know, before oh, you get it. Oh, okay. Well, let's try it. Should yeah, we try it? Yeah, let's, and let's so, see. yeah, not too bad. 
No, it's and, not bad at all. And is it, it sort really? of pockets itself in in between your uh, wrist bone, so it, you know wears well. But if you, this is one of those watches where if you just look at the specs, if you just saw seventeen millimeters and thought, oh my god, that would be, you know, that's a, what is it like? What do I say? Uh, Two dollars and twenty five cents worth of quarters, you know, like that <laughs> thick. <laughs> but uh, but no, it, the the way it's domed and the and the way it wears, um, it's, uh, it's nice. So the next up is the one watch that when people ask me what is what should they start with, maybe they're not familiar with mechanical watches, what is the best value mechanical watch? This is usually one that I point them towards. So this is the Kaki, um, Hamilton Kaki, and then we've got the day date on here. So how did you how did you come across this one? Were you always a fan of Hamilton or? Uh, yeah, well, so uh, how, it, uh, how it happened was uh, this watch shows up a lot uh, in the uh, everyday carry community. So it was one of the mechanical watches, like a military style, style mechanical watch, good value, like you said. Um, and I kept seeing it, you know, um, I, I'm a, you know, I, I follow a bunch of everyday carry guys and I, you know, I typically have like a flashlight and a, and a, and a knife and, and a pen, et cetera, that sort of stuff in, you know, ready to solve any problem. And uh, yeah, this one, you know, the, the khaki uh, kept coming up. Um, and so I, you know, I was looking at them and I, I, really caught my eye the the king the khaki king here is nice that uh the full day at the top um you know some people that it sort of bugs them that it like covers the 12 or that it cuts off numbers oh, yeah. but i think it's uh you know it's that it's that day date uh you know the full day um you know serious business watch so uh that's what sort of drew me to it and it's interesting because this was uh, my second uh, Swiss mechanical. And it spoiled me because it, it has a great ETA movement in it. It is super accurate. Um, and for the money, you know, it just, it can't, you know, really can't beat it for the, for the, you know, the case, the finishing, the, you know, the, the movement, etc. Yeah, I think because you can regularly get them below $400, can't mm -hmm. you, I think? Yeah. And it, it just represents a great value also. Even though it, you know, they're owned by Swatch now, so you've got all of the great, um, you know, backing of the Swatch Group. But it was a classic American brand, Hamilton. You know, from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, a real titan of U.S. watchmaking at one time before the the quartz crisis. Um, and then last up here is one of my favorite in your collection. Now we've just been looking at my turtle as we alluded to in the intro, but this is one one of the, was this one of the first turtles that you modded or? Yeah, yeah, so so it was, uh, so I I bought it, I bought it new and it kind of kicked off my uh, uh, modding uh, experience or should I say, you know, getting interested in, in modding watches. And uh, the, the backstory was I simply wanted to change over the hand, uh, the second to a lollipop second to match the original turtle. So the, the new turtle has the long, you know, black with the lollipop on the wrong side. <laughs> and so I, uh, I just simply wanted to change the hands and, uh, you know, went to, to, spoke to a bunch of people and, you know, it was going to be a, a bunch of money and, uh, you know, and they'd have to take the whole watch apart, et cetera. And I thought, well, I'm a mechanical guy. I can, I can take things apart. It's just tiny stuff. Um, and so all the tools to take a watch apart and to, to get in there are, were about what I was going to spend on having someone change the hands on it. So I decided to, uh, to take it, take it, uh, take it to myself and, uh, and, and do it myself. Yes. Yeah, so you've done a great job of this. So this looks like it could, you've done that good a job of it. It almost doesn't look like a mod straight off. You've got the, the lollipop hand and then you've put a coin edge bezel mm -hmm. on it, which I didn't notice straight away, but as soon as you, you, you move it, you can tell it's a significant upgrade to the, the Seiko one. And then is this is this ceramic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and loom too. So loom ceramic uh, bezel insert uh, from that company. And uh, yeah, saf sapphire, AR coated. Um, it's interesting. So this one is like, this this watch definitely has been a, a journey of, uh, of watch modding and I, and I like, I like the look uh, for for Seiko mods. Uh, I like the look at like this is something that Seiko could have made. Yeah, you know that's that for me is is what's cool about this watch. And is it got the original Hesselite on it or? Uh, no, so it's so it's switched over to Sapphire. I actually uh, actually uh, had the I had no problem with the original crystal, but but actually I was uh, I was cleaning it and dropped it, 
and uh, sad and broke the Hesalite crystal, the, uh, you know, and had to, and I said, well, all right, I guess I'm gonna have to switch it to Sapphire. Uh, but, but I had to completely 100% take it apart. I'll, uh, I'll show you a picture uh, yeah. and, and rebuild it from scratch. So this, this watch has been taken apart and rebuilt like four or five times. So guys, that was a great look at Chris's current collection. So Chris, thank you so much for uh, going through that. Uh, guys, if you've got any questions, ask them in the comment section down below. You can obviously catch me on any of my social media links. And if you're wanting a closer look at Chris's collection, here's a link to his Instagram. I'll also put a link in the description. So thanks for taking us through that, Chris. Yeah, thanks so much.